So that's a good thing, biologically younger, as we're becoming chronologically older. Um, that led me to thinking about long-lived things, and as I mentioned before, whales, certain sharks, and of course, the turtle and the tortoise. And that caused me, in turn, to reach out to our old pal, Peter Loffer, who has been on our stage before. His quest last time was butterflies. butterflies this was. time, he's written about turtles, a fabulous book called Dreaming in Turtle, and I'm dying to hear about Fred. And you will hear about Excellent. Fred Moses, but first, but first, as we say on the radio and television, just a quick throwback to the butterfly book because that led to the turtles. And you probably don't remember, but there was a paragraph in the book that dealt with a Philippine forest turtle that had been deemed extinct. Yes. And then it was found again, and the predators, collectors, and others, for various reasons, including longevity and health, they thought, found the colony, and it almost became extinct again. So one of the messages about turtles is we have a real responsibility. And after living with Fred, and you'll hear about Fred in a moment, I feel, I feel so close to that. So thank you for inviting me back. Oh, yes, a great pleasure. A great pleasure. You pursue very interesting things, Peter. Thank you. So I want to tell you this origin story. I found out about that turtle in the Philippines, and I thought, this is a book. I want to investigate what's going on with turtles, because as many of you undoubtedly know, across cultures and across time, throughout human history, turtles have been present. And Daria, are you around? Because I need your help here for a second. Thank you. Throughout our human history, turtles have been around as a signifier of wisdom, of longevity, and of fertility. And this plays, of course, directly to what we're talking about this afternoon. But one of the things I found fascinating as I researched this book is that all of us, all of us have a turtle story. And and you have a turtle story. And this is a great parlor trick because it always works. So let's take a look. Here is Curtis E. Daria, find out, please, his turtle story. All right. Uh, our turtle story would be that we were driving to the country, and all of a sudden my dad slammed on the brakes because this tiny little turtle was just in the middle of the street. And so that turtle came with us to the cottage, and has been living with us ever since. And has been living ever since with Curtis. Thank you, Curtis. And that is such a common story, especially in Southern California, where the box turtles, the desert box turtles, and that's what Fred is, wander on the highway, and families like Curtis's pick them, them, pick them up, take them home, and in Southern California now, there are more of those turtles in captivity than in the wild, and the ones in captivity can't go back into the wild because of the pathogens that they now carry from their interaction with us. Now, let's see. We've got the front row here. Sir, we are going to hear your turtle story. What is your name? My name's Manish. I'm from the West Coast. And what is your turtle story? I can go mythological if you don't mind. What? Mythological. Uh, you, mythology. You, you may, as long as you can keep it as crisp as <laughs> Absolutely. Curtis. Absolutely. So according to the Hindu mythology, the universe, our planet, sits on top of three elephants who actually sit on top of three more tortoises. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And this is another example. Throughout our mythologies, including here in North America, as you undoubtedly know, the turtle plays this very important history. Thank you, Daria. And maybe we do it again toward the end, depending on how I run out the clock. So I decided to travel the world. I went to all five of the continents where turtles exist on the Natch. There are no indigenous turtles in Antarctica, and looked to find out what it is about that human connection that is so special. I started in Cuba, and in Havana, had the opportunity to go to the altar of a Santeria priest who had 
just sacrificed a couple of chickens to learn what it is, remember we're talking health and longevity, what it is about the turtle sacrifice because that is legal and conducted in both the Palo and Santeria religions in Cuba and the Caribbean. What, what is it that drives this? And, and the Santeria priest gave me the explanation that people come to him with ailments, often these are sexual dysfunction, ailments, but other concerns, concerns about longevity, and a turtle sacrifice for a variety of reasons in that particular religion, those two religions, is supposedly beneficial. And then as I was saying goodbye to him and thanking him, he looked at me and he said, are you living with a turtle? And I, I said, no. He said, you must. You must for the good energy, and for your health. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, when you're hanging out with a Santeria priest and he tells you what to do, it's probably not a good idea to violate that. And I went home to Oregon, and I made arrangements with colleagues at the Turtle Conservancy to foster Fred. And Fred was shipped up from a refuge outside of Prescott, Arizona, and lived with us in our home in Oregon for quite some time while I was researching the book. And what I learned from Fred, as I'll tell you during the next few minutes, is that a turtle can, in fact, help you toward good health. And remember earlier the words we heard about stress and the importance of reducing stress, or at least reducing negative stress. Now, how did that turtle get from Prescott, Arizona to Eugene, Oregon? You might wonder, well, there is a business opportunity almost anywhere and everywhere, and that turtle came up to me via a company called shipyourreptile.com. So any of you who are un or underemployed or looking for a little extra money, there's always something. There is always something. Now, I connected with Fred slowly, as is probably appropriate, and I'd come down for breakfast, and I would look at him, and he'd look at me, and I'd try to determine whether there was a personality there, because turtle aficionados were telling me that there is a personality in every turtle and they differ and turtle aficionados were telling me that turtles recognize people and I was trying to establish this rapport. Mostly we just looked at each other for those first several weeks. And, and I noticed though that, that I, and maybe you can even tell by my delivery here, I tend to have what my son considers too much coffee. And, <laughs> And when I was with Fred, he would slow me down and we would just look at each other. So turtles, turtles have been around in one form or another since the dinosaurs went the way we seem to be sending ourselves. And, and they are pretty much unchanged. So one of the magical aspects of turtles is, is how they connect us with that dinosaur period, with, with our prehistory. And they, they uh, consequently suffer from those of us humans who do nasty things to each other and to animals. So, so for the purposes of pets, which can be maybe good but certainly bad for the purpose of food, for the purpose of traditional Chinese medicine, often for aphrodisiacs and for ornaments, turtles are preyed on by us. Now there are all sorts of international and local treaties and laws to try to protect turtles and, and uh, there are, there's the farming of turtles so that you could eat turtle meat and maybe feel the same way you could feel comfortable if you do about eating farmed fish, but for the same reasons that probably all of you would rather eat a wild salmon than eat a farmed salmon, most of the people who are, or at least the ones I've encountered, looking to interact with turtles want the wild thing. 
So now, as the middle classes in Asia, primarily in China and Vietnam, have become more and more affluent, they have, these are obviously very general terms, there are millions and millions of people, but they have become reconnected with the long-time roots that turtles have had with cultures over there. And the result has been a resurgence of use of turtles for those aforementioned activities and an interest in the wild turtles, and particularly an interest in wild turtles from North America, Louisiana, Texas, and Florida in the states, prime locations where turtles are being pulled out illegally and transshipped from the west coast of North America, Canada included, to Asia. Some wild stories, some you may have heard about. Kai Zhu, university student, paying for his education, he said, by smuggling turtles, cross from Detroit to Windsor, caught by the authorities with 50-plus turtles stuffed down his pants. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but for years, for years, Turtle smuggling and animal smuggling, even though it's the same types of corridors and often the same types of bad guys as guns and drugs, have been a low-risk, high-reward proposition. That's starting to change. And Kai Zhu was sentenced in federal court south of the border in the States to five years for his turtle smuggling. Five years. Now, we, we can debate whether or not prison time is appropriate, but nonetheless, the attention given because of that case and others like it to the, the severity of the crime is intriguing. He's out now. He served a few of those five years. But what's the money? What's the money? So I was in Yunnan province in China doing some of this research, and in, Kun, Kun, in Kunming, I went to the Kunming uh, Zoological Society and met with a guy who, like the Philippine forest turtle, had come upon a colony of what had been deemed a, a, an extinct species, the Yunnan box turtle. And there, there are a handful that we know about, there is a handful that we know about, of these box turtles that have been, that were wild and are now in captivity at the Zoological Society where an assurance colony is. I'm trying to decide whether to play with you all in the audience here, and I think I will again. An assurance colony has been established. Now, on the black market, somebody sing out what you think a Yunnan box turtle is, what, what you can buy one if you go to some negative space on the internet. 400. 400 what? 400 what? Let's hear another number. $10,000. $1,500. One more? $12. No. <laughs> 200,000 US dollars. 200,000 US dollars. For those of you with criminal minds, I'm giving you lots of ideas. <laughs> if you don't want to go to China, go to Madagascar and look at the plowshare turtle critically endangered, critically endangered, and a, an adult plowshare, $50,000 on the black market. This is terrible stuff going on. While I was in China on WeChat, I was offered from Madagascar, not the, the, the turtles were from Madagascar, they were in China, and, and, and uh, uh, those were the, that, that were not adults, Twenty and thirty thousand dollars. It's incredible the amount of money. Who wants these things? It's the same old people who have always been after that which they're not supposed to have, can't have, you know, some, something that's rare that they want to have as their possession. Now, Wade Davis was talking earlier today about the responsibility we have north of the Mexican border, we in general have 
for something like the ongoing war in Colombia and the problem with cocaine. Who had coffee this morning in Starbucks across the street? Hands up. Any of you? Okay. Who would prefer Tim Hortons? Tim Hortons right there. And of course we have coffee here so you don't need to go out. But here's a straw from Starbucks and here's a straw from Tim Hortons. And if we open these packages, inside there's a plastic straw from Starbucks and here is a plastic straw from Tim Hortons. Up the nostrils of the sea turtles and other diabolical realities for something that so simply can be replaced with either slurp it through your lips, Charlie, or <laughs> use a paper straw. So these, oops, that's another prop here I have in that pocket. I don't want to smash it. So we need to think about our own responsibilities here. We need to think about our laws. We need to think about enforcement of the laws. Think about the fact that in the United States, the Fish and Wildlife Service, before Trump, who knows now what the numbers are, 200 agents out in the field compared to a multiplier that's beyond comprehension for the Drug Enforcement Administration, why are we not more concerned about the wildlife and the wildlife laws, especially with turtles. Now, let's get specifically to health. In Gabon, I went to a laboratory where a guy was grinding up turtle shells because he made a paste with it to treat external hemorrhoids. In Hong Kong, buy turtle jelly for what? the overall maintaining your health result. Now, the good news about turtle jelly is usually when the stuff's analyzed, there's very little, if any, turtle carapace in it. So that's good to know. In, in uh, Buddhist temples often, and in particular when I went to in Bangkok, feeding turtles to disgustingness for what are called merits, it's good for you if you stuff food into these turtles, and then for aphrodisiacs. And in Costa Rica, I had the opportunity to go into the wilds with a fellow who introduced me to a, to a uh, turtle poacher, and then to a bar where the salsa is made with the turtle legs that is supposed to increase, gents, your virility. Now, just to get a sense of how diabolical we humans can be regarding our interaction with animals, apparently, these concoctions are often spiked with Viagra. So the result is it works for somebody, and then they perceive it to be not the product of the drug industry, but the product of the turtles. So it's not really a book about turtles. It's a book about people dreaming in turtle, about the obsessive collectors, about that power of what I can't have, about understandable medical hope and, and desperation. What wouldn't you do, and why not try turtles, especially, and all kinds of parts of turtles, from the bones to the meat to the carapace? What wouldn't you do, especially if you're being told that it works? Now, let's, let me tell you a good story to close about Fred. I could tell a lot of stories about Fred because we did get to know each other. I still am not at all convinced that he knew me as more than a purveyor of food. And the fellow who sent him up from Prescott said, just feed him dog food every once in a while, maybe a banana, it'll be fine. But initially, he didn't eat it all. And my wife, Sheila, went to, speaking of corporate disasters, Whole Foods, and, and, and bought this uh, organic dog food and mixed it with, with uh, organic 
mango to try to entice him. But what finally worked to get him eating, to get him eating, was, uh, <laughs> there are just too many corporate behemoths here, a trip down to Walmart to get a cottage cheese-like carton full of, of uh, night crawlers. And, and passive Fred, the guy who acted like Valium to me in the mornings and chilled me out as we just looked at each other and considered life from our two different points of view, passive Fred just went for these live night crawlers, and there was that connection to the dinosaur era, watching him stalk them and grab them and shake them around and chew on them and bite them down to bite-sized pieces. And one particular day when he left a little bit hanging out of his mouth <laughs> and he looked a little bit like Fidel Castro chewing on a cigar. And there's a Fidel Castro connection to Turtles too, but I'm out of time, so you're going to have to read the book. <laughs> Dreaming in Turtle, and it's so nice to be back with you all here in Canada so far from Trump land. Thank you, Moses. Thank you. I think that's what you wanted. Now, listen, I have something in my pocket here, please. Speaking of longevity, this I brought for Connie because she expressed interest in it, but I can't find her, so let me give it to you. This is a West Coast, North America redwood. And this guy, this sapling, potentially is going to hang around for 2,000 years at least and provide some kind of health because... It just is nice looking at them and smelling them. So here's this, and don't steal it. It's for Connie, okay? okay. <laughs> yeah. um, and this is the book. This is the book. And I wanted to ask you, because so much of your talk had to do with the depredations yes. uh, of the fact that this is one of the most hunted species on the planet, that uh, I want to ask you about the age of turtles. Yes. Yes, and, and what do you know of the oldest? Uh, yeah, on well, record? Fred was based, I, I'm learning, based on the scarring of his carapace, 35, 50 years old, and could easily, in good care, have another 50 years ahead of him. Mm -hmm. A century is not unknown. There are tales of much longer, not necessarily documented. But uh, these are guys who outlive us. I've met people who give their young children a turtle mm. because, or a tortoise because they think that that's going to be a lifelong pet. There is a, a Fidel Castro joke where he was given, this is apocryphal, he was given a turtle as a, as a present, and he said to the gift giver, these, these animals live a really long time, right? And the, and the gift giver said, yes, about 100 years. And Fidel Castro handed it back to him and said, that's the problem with pets. You know, you get attached to them and they die on you. <laughs> that's good. Moses, I want that's, to get your picture. Yes, we want to get a picture. Will you all um, stand side by side right here and let sure. me turn toward me? Are they like trees in the sense that you can read off their carapace how old they are? If you know what you're doing, supposedly you can get a sense from the way the carapace grows, yes. Okay. And John, have you got some of those pictures of turtles? Oh, and in all the reading, it's always turtles and tortoises, tortoises and turtles. Yes. Nobody explains the difference. Is there a difference? There is a difference, and we can throw terrapins in too. For the most part, generally, a tortoise is a land animal, a turtle is a water animal, and a terrapin's a little h. Okay, so we see from these kinds of pictures that they're related to reptiles. I mean, that's they are part reptiles. of the. They yes, are. Yes. Yes, and and we have some pictures that I thought were stunning. John, can you put up the more extreme ones? We'll put it like this. Yeah. Okay. Are we going to shoot it that uh, way? Okay. I want to know, is that for real? 
or is that a gag? Well, I don't know that particular guy, Moses, but they are so weird that they, in the Natch, yeah. are weirder than any gag we could come up with, probably. So, I, I don't know, everybody who's like tender and a little snowflake, just cover your ears, but this apparatus and its ability to shrink and expand. Yes. Um, is, is, is there any um, possibility that this is an evolutionary development that... What are you trying to say, Moses? <laughs> I mean, holy cow. Let's get, let's get a picture. Uh, yes, okay. thank you. This is going downhill. Okay, this is... <laughs> Come on, let's get this picture. <laughs> <laughs>